The third part of Chapter Twenty Nine of Women in Love. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. The third part of Chapter Twenty Nine. Continental. After dinner she wanted to go out for a minute, to look at the world. The company tried to dissuade her, it was so terribly cold. But just to look, she said. They all four wrapped up warmly, and found themselves in a vague, unsubstantial outdoors of dim snow and ghosts of an upper world, that made strange shadows before the stars. It was indeed cold bruisingly, frighteningly, unnaturally cold. Ursula could not believe the air in her nostrils. It seemed conscious, malevolent, purposive in its intense, murderous coldness. Yet it was wonderful, an intoxication, a silence of dim, unrealised snow, of the invisible intervening between her and the visible between her and the flashing stars. She could see Orion sloping up. How wonderful he was, wonderful enough to make one cry aloud. And all around was this cradle of snow, and there was firm snow underfoot that struck with heavy cold through her boot soles. It was night and silence. She imagined she could hear the stars. She imagined distinctly she could hear the celestial musical motion of the stars quite near at hand. She seemed like a bird flying amongst their harmonious motion. And she clung close to Birkin. Suddenly she realised she did not know what he was thinking. She did not know where he was ranging. "'My love,' she said, stopping to look at him. His face was pale, his eyes dark, there was a faint spark of starlight on them, and he saw her face soft and upturned to him very near. He kissed her softly. "'What then?' he asked. "'Do you love me?' she asked. Too much, he answered quietly. She clung a little closer. Not too much, she pleaded. Far too much, he said, almost sadly. And does it make you sad that I am everything to you? she asked, wistful. He held her close to him, kissing her, and saying, scarcely audible, no, but I feel like a beggar, I feel poor. She was silent, looking at the stars now. Then she kissed him. Don't be a beggar, she pleaded wistfully. It isn't ignominious that you love me. It is ignominious to feel poor, isn't it? he replied. Why, why should it be? she asked. He only stood still in the terribly cold air that moved invisibly over the mountain tops, folding her round with his arms. "'I couldn't bear this cold, eternal place without you,' he said. "'I couldn't bear it. It would kill the quick of my life.' She kissed him again suddenly. "'Do you hate it?' she asked, puzzled, wondering. If I couldn't come near to you, if you weren't here, I should hate it. I couldn't bear it, he answered. But the people are nice, she said. I mean the stillness, the cold, the frozen eternality, he said. She wondered. Then her spirit came home to him, nestling unconscious in him. Yes. It is good we are warm and together, she said. And they turned home again. 
they saw the golden lights of the hotel glowing out in the night of snow silence, small in the hollow, like a cluster of yellow berries. It seemed like a bunch of sun-sparks, tiny and orange in the midst of the snow darkness. Behind was a high shadow of a peak, blotting out the stars like a ghost. They drew near to their home. They saw a man come from the dark building with a lighted lantern, which swung golden, and made that his dark feet walked in a halo of snow. He was a small, dark figure in the darkened snow. He unlatched the door of an outhouse. A smell of cows, hot, animal, almost like beef, came out on the heavily cold air. There was a glimpse of two cattle in their dark stalls, then the door was shut again, and not a chink of light showed. It had reminded Ursula again of home, of the marsh, of her childhood, and of the journey to Brussels, and, strangely, of Anton Skrebensky. Oh, God, could one bear it, this past which was gone down the abyss? Could she bear that it ever had been? She looked round this silent upper world of snow and stars and powerful cold. There was another world, like views on a magic lantern, the marsh, Cossethay, Ilkeston, lit up with a common, unreal light. There was a shadowy, unreal Ursula, a whole shadow-play of an unreal life. It was as unreal and circumscribed as a magic lantern show. She wished the slides could all be broken. She wished it could be gone for ever, like a lantern slide which was broken. She wanted to have no past. She wanted to have come down from the slopes of heaven to this place, with Birkin, not to have toiled out of the murk of her childhood and her upbringing, slowly all soiled. She felt that memory was a dirty trick played upon her. What was this decree that she should remember? Why not a bath of pure oblivion, a new birth, without any recollections or blemish of a past life? She was with Birkin. She had just come into life, here in the high snow against the stars. What had she to do with parents and antecedents? She knew herself new and unbegotten. She had no father, no mother, no anterior connections. She was herself, pure and silvery. She belonged only to the oneness with Birkin, a oneness that struck deeper notes, sounding into the heart of the universe the heart of reality, where she had never existed before. Even Gudrun was a separate unit, separate, separate, having nothing to do with this self, this Ursula, in her new world of reality. That old shadow world, the actuality of the past, oh, let it go! She rose free on the wings of her new condition. Gudrun and Gerald had not come in. They had walked up the valley straight in front of the house, not like Ursula and Birkin, onto the little hill at the right. Gudrun was driven by a strange desire. She wanted to plunge on and on till she came to the end of the valley of snow. Then she wanted to climb the wall of white finality, climb over into the peaks that sprang up like sharp petals in the heart of the frozen, mysterious navel of the world. She felt that there, over the strange, blind, terrible wall of rocky snow, 
there in the navel of the mystic world, among the final cluster of peaks, there in the infolded navel of it all, was her consummation. If she could but come there alone, and pass into the infolded navel of eternal snow, and of uprising immortal peaks of snow and rock, she would be a oneness with all. She would be herself the eternal, infinite silence, the sleeping, timeless, frozen centre of the All. They went back to the house, to the Reunion Saal. She was curious to see what was going on. The men there made her alert, roused her curiosity. It was a new taste of life for her. They were so prostrate before her, yet so full of life. The party was boisterous. They were dancing all together, dancing the Schuhplatteln, the Tyrolese dance of the clapping hands and tossing the partner in the air at the crisis. The Germans were all proficient. They were from Munich, chiefly. Gerald also was quite passable. There were three zithers twanging away in a corner. It was a scene of great animation and confusion. The professor was initiating Ursula into the dance, stamping, clapping, and swinging her high with amazing force and zest. When the crisis came, even Birkin was behaving manfully with one of the professor's fresh, strong daughters, who was exceedingly happy. Everybody was dancing. There was the most boisterous turmoil. Gudrun looked on with delight. The solid wooden floor resounded to the knocking heels of the men. The air quivered with the clapping hands and the zither music. There was a golden dust about the hanging lamps. Suddenly the dance finished. Lurka and the students rushed out to bring in drinks. There was an excited clamour of voices, a clinking of muglids, a great crying of, Pause it! Pause it! Lurka was everywhere at once, like a gnome, suggesting drinks for the women, making an obscure, slightly risky joke with the men, confusing and mystifying the waiter. He wanted very much to dance with Gudrun. From the first moment he had seen her, he wanted to make a connection with her. Instinctively she felt this, and she waited for him to come up. But a kind of sulkiness kept him away from her, so she thought he disliked her. "'Will you shoe plattern, gnädige Frau?' said the large, fair youth, Lurker's companion. He was too soft, too humble for Gudrun's taste. But she wanted to dance, and the fair youth, who was called Leitner, was handsome enough in his uneasy, slightly abject fashion, a humility that covered a certain fear. She accepted him as a partner. The zithers sounded out again, the dance began. Gerald led them laughing with one of the professor's daughters, Ursula danced with one of the students, Birkin with the other daughter of the professor, the professor with Frau Kramer, and the rest of the men danced together, with quite as much zest as if they had had women partners. Because Gudrun had danced with the well-built soft youth, his companion Lurker was more pettish and exasperated than ever, and would not even notice her existence in the room. This piqued her but she made up to herself by dancing with the professor, who was strong as a mature, well-seasoned bull, and as full of coarse energy. She could not bear him critically, and yet she enjoyed being rushed through the dance, and tossed up into the air on his coarse, powerful impetus. The professor enjoyed it too. He eyed her with strange, large, blue eyes, full of galvanic fire. She hated him for the seasoned, semi-paternal animalism with which he regarded her. But she admired his weight of strength. 
The room was charged with excitement and strong animal emotion. Lurka was kept away from Gudrun, to whom he wanted to speak, as by a hedge of thorns, and he felt a sardonic ruthless hatred for this young love-companion, Leitner, who was his penniless dependent. He mocked the youth with an acid ridicule that made Leitner red in the face and impotent with resentment. Gerald, who had now got the dance perfectly, was dancing again with the younger of the professor's daughters, who was almost dying of virgin excitement, because she thought Gerald so handsome, so superb. He had her in his power, as if she were a palpitating bird, a fluttering, flushing, bewildered creature. And it made him smile as she shrank convulsively between his hands, violently, when he must throw her into the air. At the end she was so overcome with prostrate love for him that she could scarcely speak sensibly at all. Birkin was dancing with Ursula. There were odd little fires playing in his eyes. He seemed to have turned into something wicked and flickering, mocking, suggestive, quite impossible. Ursula was frightened of him, and fascinated. Clear before her eyes, as in a vision, she could see the sardonic, licentious mockery of his eyes. He moved towards her with subtle, animal, indifferent approach. The strangeness of his hands, which came quick and cunning, inevitably to the vital place beneath her breasts, and lifting with mocking, suggestive impulse, carried her through the air as if without strength, through black magic, made her swoon with fear. For a moment she revolted. It was horrible. She would break the spell. But before the resolution had formed, she had submitted again, yielded to her fear. He knew all the time what he was doing. She could see it in his smiling, concentrated eyes. It was his responsibility. She would leave it to him. When they were alone in the darkness, she felt the strange licentiousness of him hovering upon her. She was troubled and repelled. Why should he turn like this? "'What is it?' she asked in dread. But his face only glistened on her, unknown, horrible. And yet she was fascinated. Her impulse was to repel him violently, break from this spell of mocking brutishness. But she was too fascinated. She wanted to submit. She wanted to know. What would he do to her? He was so attractive and so repulsive at one. The sardonic suggestivity that flickered over his face and looked from his narrowed eyes made her want to hide, to hide herself away from him and watch him from somewhere unseen. "'Why are you like this?' she demanded again, rousing against him with sudden force and animosity. The flickering fires in his eyes concentrated as he looked into her eyes. Then the lids drooped, with a faint motion of satiric contempt. Then they rose again to the same remorseless suggestivity. And she gave way. He might do as he would. His licentiousness was repulsively attractive. But he was self-responsible. She would see what it was. They might do as they liked. This she realised as she went to sleep. How could anything that gave one satisfaction be excluded? What was degrading? Who cared? Degrading things were real, with a different reality and he was so unabashed and unrestrained. Wasn't it rather horrible 
a man who could be so soulful and spiritual, now to be so—' She balked at her own thoughts and memories. Then she added, "'So bestial! So bestial, they too, so degraded!' She winced. But after all, why not? She exulted as well. Why not be bestial and go the whole round of experience? She exulted in it. She was bestial. How good it was to be really shameful! There would be no shameful thing she had not experienced. Yet she was unabashed, she was herself. Why not? She was free when she knew everything, and no dark, shameful things were denied her. Gudrun, who had been watching Gerald in the Réunionsaal, suddenly thought, He should have all the women he can. It is his nature. It is absurd to call him monogamous. He is naturally promiscuous, that is his nature. The thought came to her involuntarily. It shocked her somewhat. It was as if she had seen some new mene mene upon the wall. Yet it was merely true. A voice seemed to have spoken it to her so clearly that for the moment she believed in inspiration. It is really true, she said to herself again. She knew quite well she had believed it all along. She knew it implicitly. But she must keep it dark, almost from herself. She must keep it completely secret. It was knowledge for her alone, and scarcely even to be admitted to herself. The deep resolve formed in her to combat him. One of them must triumph over the other. Which should it be? Her soul steeled itself with strength. Almost she laughed within herself at her confidence. It woke a certain keen, half-contemptuous pity, tenderness for him. She was so ruthless. Everybody retired early. The professor and Lurker went into a small lounge to drink. They both watched Gudrun go along the landing by the railing upstairs. "'Ein schönes Frauenzimmer,' said the professor. "'Ja,' asserted Lurker shortly. Gerald walked with his queer, long wolf-steps across the bedroom to the window, stooped and looked out then rose again and turned to Gudrun, his eyes sharp with an abstract smile. He seemed very tall to her. She saw the glisten of his whitish eyebrows that met between his brows. "'How do you like it?' he said. He seemed to be laughing inside himself quite unconsciously. She looked at him. He was a phenomenon to her, not a human being, a sort of creature, greedy. "'I like it very much,' she replied. "'Who do you like best downstairs?' he asked, standing tall and glistening above her, with his glistening stiff hair erect. "'Who do I like best?' she repeated wanting to answer his question, and finding it difficult to collect herself. "'Why, I don't know. I don't know enough about them yet, to be able to say. Who do you like best?' "'Oh, I don't care. I don't like or dislike any of them. It doesn't matter about me. I wanted to know about you.' "'But why?' she asked, going rather pale. The abstract, unconscious smile in his eyes was intensified. "'I wanted to know,' he said. She turned aside, breaking the spell. In some strange way she felt he was getting power over her. 
"'Well, I can't tell you already,' she said. She went to the mirror to take out the hairpins from her hair. She stood before the mirror every night for some minutes, brushing her fine, dark hair. It was part of the inevitable ritual of her life. He followed her and stood behind her. She was busy with bent head, taking out the pins, and shaking her warm hair loose. When she looked up, she saw him in the glass standing behind her, watching unconsciously, not consciously seeing her, and yet watching with fine pupilled eyes that seemed to smile, and which were not really smiling. She started. It took all her courage for her to continue brushing her hair, as usual, for her to pretend she was at her ease. She was far, far from being at her ease with him. She beat her brains wildly for something to say to him. "'What are your plans for to-morrow?' she asked nonchalantly, whilst her heart was beating so furiously, her eyes were so bright with strange nervousness, she felt he could not but observe. But she knew also that he was completely blind, blind as a wolf looking at her. It was a strange battle between her ordinary consciousness and his uncanny black art consciousness. "'I don't know,' he replied. "'What would you like to do?' He spoke emptily, his mind was sunk away. "'Oh,' she said, with easy protestation, "'I'm ready for anything. Anything will be fine for me, I'm sure.' And to herself she was saying, "'God, why am I so nervous? Why are you so nervous, you fool? If he sees it, I'm done for for ever. You know you're done for for ever, if he sees the absurd state you're in.' and she smiled to herself as if it were all child's play. Meanwhile her heart was plunging, she was almost fainting. She could see him in the mirror as he stood there behind her, tall and overarching, blonde and terribly frightening. She glanced at his reflection with furtive eyes, willing to give anything to save him from knowing she could see him. He did not know she could see his reflection. He was looking unconsciously, glisteningly, down at her head, from which the hair fell loose as she brushed it with wild, nervous hand. She held her head aside and brushed and brushed her hair madly. For her life she could not turn round and face him. For her life she could not and the knowledge made her almost sink to the ground in a faint, helpless, spent. She was aware of his frightening, impending figure standing close behind her. She was aware of his hard, strong, unyielding chest close upon her back. And she felt she could not bear it any more. In a few minutes she would fall down at his feet, grovelling at his feet, and letting him destroy her. The thought pricked up all her sharp intelligence and presence of mind. She dared not turn round to him, and there he stood, motionless, unbroken. Summoning all her strength, she said, in a full, resonant, nonchalant voice, that was forced out with all her remaining self-control, "'Oh, would you mind looking in that bag behind there, and giving me my—' here. Her power fell inert. "'My what? My what?' she screamed in silence to herself. But he had started round, surprised and startled that she should ask him to look in her bag, which she always kept so very private to herself. She turned now, her face white, her dark eyes blazing with uncanny, overwrought excitement. She saw him stooping to the bag undoing the loosely buckled strap, unattentive. "'Your what?' he asked. "'Oh, 
a little enamel box, yellow, with a design of a cormorant plucking her breast. She went towards him, stooping her beautiful bare arm, and deftly turned some of her things, disclosing the box, which was exquisitely painted. "'That is it, see?' she said, taking it from under his eyes. And he was baffled now. He was left to fasten up the bag whilst she swiftly did up her hair for the night, and sat down to unfasten her shoes. She would not turn her back to him any more. He was baffled, frustrated, but unconscious. She had the whip-hand over him now. She knew he had not realised her terrible panic. Her heart was beating heavily still. Fool! Fool that she was to get into such a state! How she thanked God for Gerald's obtuse blindness! Thank God he could see nothing! She sat slowly unlacing her shoes, and he too commenced to undress. Thank God that crisis was over! She felt almost fond of him now, almost in love with him. "'Oh, Gerald!' she laughed, caressively, teasingly. "'Oh, what a fine game you played with the Professor's daughter, didn't you now?' "'What game?' he asked, looking round. "'Isn't she in love with you? Oh, dear, isn't she in love with you?' said Gudrun, in her gayest, most attractive mood. "'I shouldn't think so,' he said. "'Shouldn't think so?' she teased. "'Why, the poor girl is lying at this moment, overwhelmed, dying with love for you.' She thinks you're wonderful, oh, marvellous, beyond what man has ever been. Really, isn't it funny? Why funny? What is funny? he asked. Why, to see you working it on her, she said, with a half reproach that confused the male conceit in him. Really, Gerald, the poor girl! I did nothing to her, he said. Oh, it was too shameful, the way you simply swept her off her feet. That was shoe platoon, he replied with a bright grin. Ha, <laughs> laughed Gudrun. Her mockery quivered through his muscles with curious re-echoes. When he slept, he seemed to crouch down in the bed lapped up in his own strength, that yet was hollow. And Gudrun slept strongly, a victorious sleep. Suddenly she was almost fiercely awake. The small timber room glowed with the dawn that came upwards from the low window. She could see down the valley when she lifted her head the snow with a pinkish, half-revealed magic, the fringe of pine-trees at the bottom of the slope, and one tiny figure moved over the vaguely illuminated space. She glanced at his watch. It was seven o'clock. He was still completely asleep, and she was so hard awake it was almost frightening. A hard, metallic wakefulness. She lay looking at him. He slept in the subjection of his own health and defeat. She was overcome by a sincere regard for him. Till now she was afraid before him. She lay and thought about him. What he was. What he represented in the world. A fine, independent will he had. She thought of the revolution he had worked in the mines in so short a time. She knew that if he were confronted with any problem, any hard, actual difficulty, he would overcome it. If he laid hold of any idea, he would carry it through. 
he had the faculty of making order out of confusion. Only let him grip hold of a situation, and he would bring to pass an inevitable conclusion. For a few moments she was borne away on the wild wings of ambition. Gerald, with his force of will, and his power for comprehending the actual world, should be set to solve the problems of the day, the problem of industrialism in the modern world. She knew he would, in the course of time, effect the changes he desired. He could reorganise the industrial system. She knew he could do it. As an instrument in these things he was marvellous. She had never seen any man with his potentiality. He was unaware of it, but she knew. He only needed to be hitched on. He needed that his hand should be set to the task, because he was so unconscious. And this she could do. She would marry him. He would go into Parliament in the Conservative interest. He would clear up the great muddle of labour and industry. He was so superbly fearless, masterful. He knew that every problem could be worked out, in life as in geometry. And he would care neither about himself nor about anything but the pure working out of the problem. He was very pure, really. Her heart beat fast. She flew away on wings of elation, imagining a future. He would be a Napoleon of peace, or a Bismarck, and she the woman behind him. She had read Bismarck's letters, and had been deeply moved by them. And Gerald would be freer, more dauntless than Bismarck. But even as she lay in fictitious transport, bathed in the strange, false sunshine of hope in life, something seemed to snap in her, and a terrible cynicism began to gain upon her, blowing in like a wind. Everything turned to irony with her. The last flavour of everything was ironical. When she felt her pang of undeniable reality, this was when she knew the hard irony of hopes and ideas. She lay and looked at him as he slept. He was sheerly beautiful. He was a perfect instrument. To her mind he was a pure, inhuman, almost superhuman instrument. His instrumentality appealed so strongly to her. She wished she were God to use him as a tool. And at the same instant came the ironical question, what for? She thought of the colliers wives, with their linoleum and their lace curtains, and their little girls in high-laced boots. She thought of the wives and daughters of the pit managers, their tennis parties, and their terrible struggles to be superior each to the other in the social scale. There was Shortlands with its meaningless distinction, the meaningless crowd of the cries. There was London the House of Commons, the extant social world. My God! Young as she was, Gudrun had touched the whole pulse of social England. She had no ideas of rising in the world. She knew, with the perfect cynicism of cruel youth, that to rise in the world meant to have one outside show instead of another. The advance was like having a spurious half-crown instead of a spurious penny. The whole coinage of valuation was spurious. 
yet of course her cynicism knew well enough that in a world where spurious coin was current, a bad sovereign was better than a bad farthing. But rich and poor she despised both alike. Already she mocked at herself for her dreams. They could be fulfilled easily enough. But she recognised too well in her spirit the mockery of her own impulses. What did she care that Gerald had created a richly paying industry out of an old worn-out concern? What did she care? The worn-out concern and the rapid, splendidly organised industry, they were bad money. Yet, of course, she cared a great deal, outwardly. And outwardly was all that mattered, for inwardly was a bad joke. Everything was intrinsically a piece of irony to her. She leaned over Gerald and said in her heart, with compassion, Oh, my dear! Dear, my dear, the game isn't worth even you. You are a fine thing, really. Why should you be used on such a poor show? Her heart was breaking with pity and grief for him. And at the same moment a grimace came over her mouth of mocking irony at her own unspoken tirade. Ah, what a farce it was! She thought of Parnell and Catherine O'Shea. Parnell! After all, who can take the nationalisation of Ireland seriously? Who can take political Ireland really seriously, whatever it does? And who can take political England seriously? Who can? Who can care a straw, really, how the old patched-up constitution is tinkered at any more? Who cares a button for our national ideas any more than for our national bowler hat? Ha! It's all old hat. It is all old bowler hat. That's all it is, Gerald my young hero. At any rate, we'll spare ourselves the nausea of stirring the old broth any more. You be beautiful, my Gerald, and reckless. There are perfect moments. Wake up, Gerald. Wake up. Convince me of the perfect moments. Oh, convince me. I need it. He opened his eyes and looked at her. She greeted him with a mocking, enigmatic smile, in which was a poignant gaiety. Over his face went the reflection of the smile. He smiled, too purely unconsciously. That filled her with extraordinary delight to see the smile cross his face, reflected from her face. She remembered that was how a baby smiled. It filled her with extraordinary radiant delight. "'You've done it,' she said. "'What?' he asked, dazed convinced me. And she bent down, kissing him passionately, passionately, so that he was bewildered. He did not ask her of what he had convinced her, though he meant to. He was glad she was kissing him. She seemed to be feeling for his very heart, to touch the quick of him. And he wanted her to touch the quick of his being. He wanted that most of all. 
Outside, somebody was singing in a manly, reckless, handsome voice. Mach mir auf, mach mir auf, du Stolze, mach mir ein Feuer von Holze. Vom Regen bin ich nass, vom Regen bin ich nass. Gudrun knew that that song would sound through her eternity, sung in a manly, reckless, mocking voice. It marked one of her supreme moments, the supreme pangs of her nervous gratification. There it was, fixed in eternity for her. The day came fine and bluish. There was a light wind blowing among the mountain tops, keen as a rapier where it touched, carrying with it a fine dust of snow powder. Gerald went out with the fine, blind face of a man who is in his state of fulfilment. Gudrun and he were in perfect static unity this morning, but unseeing and unwitting. They went out with a toboggan, leaving Ursula and Birkin to follow. Gudrun was all scarlet and royal blue, a scarlet jersey and cap, and a royal blue skirt and stockings. She went gaily over the white snow with Gerald beside her, in white and grey, pulling the little toboggan. They grew small in the distance of snow, climbing the steep slope. For Gudrun herself, she seemed to pass altogether into the whiteness of the snow. She became a pure, thoughtless crystal. When she reached the top of the slope, in the wind, she looked round and saw peak beyond peak of rock and snow, bluish, transcendent in heaven. And it seemed to her like a garden, with the peaks for pure flowers and her heart gathering them. She had no separate consciousness for Gerald. She held on to him as they went shearing down over the keen slope. She felt as if her senses were being whetted on some fine grindstone that was keen as flame. The snow sprinted on either side like sparks from a blade that is being sharpened. The whiteness round about ran swifter, swifter. In pure flame the white slope flew against her, and she fused like one molten dancing globule rushed through a white intensity. Then there was a great swerve at the bottom when they swung, as it were, in a fall to earth in the diminishing motion. They came to rest. But when she rose to her feet, she could not stand. She gave a strange cry, turned and clung to him, sinking her face on his breast, fainting in him. Utter oblivion came over her, as she lay for a few moments abandoned against him. "'What is it?' he was saying. "'Was it too much for you?' But she heard nothing. When she came to, she stood up and looked round, astonished. Her face was white, her eyes brilliant and large. "'What is it?' he repeated. "'Did it upset you?' She looked at him with her brilliant eyes that seemed to have undergone some transfiguration, and she laughed with a terrible merriment. No! she cried with triumphant joy. It was the complete moment of my life! And she looked at him with her dazzling, overweening laughter, like one possessed. A fine blade seemed to enter his heart, but he did not care or take any notice. But they climbed up the slope again, and they flew down through the white flame again, splendidly, splendidly. Gudrun was laughing and flashing, powdered with snow crystals. Gerald worked perfectly. He felt he could guide the toboggan to a hairbreadth. Almost he could make it 
pierce into the air and right into the very heart of the sky. It seemed to him the flying sledge was but his strength spread out. He had but to move his arms, the motion was his own. They explored the great slopes to find another slide. He felt there must be something better than they had known, and he found what he desired. A perfect, long, fierce sweep, shearing past the foot of a rock and into the trees at the base. It was dangerous, he knew, but then he knew also he would direct the sledge between his fingers. The first days passed in an ecstasy of physical motion, sleighing, skiing, skating, moving in an intensity of speed and white light that surpassed life itself, and carried the souls of the human beings beyond into an inhuman abstraction of velocity and weight and eternal frozen snow. Gerald's eyes became hard and strange, and as he went by on his skis he was more like some powerful, fateful sigh than a man. His muscles elastic, in a perfect soaring trajectory, his body projected in pure flight, mindless, soulless, whirling along one perfect line of force. Luckily there came a day of snow, when they must all stay indoors. Otherwise, Birkin said, they would all lose their faculties and begin to utter themselves in cries and shrieks, like some strange unknown species of snow creatures. End of the third part of chapter 29 Recording by Ruth Golding